if they're laughing, it's fine. If they're not, it ain't. This is the Russell Howard we have never seen before. When you're low, it leaves you mentally fragile, but then that makes you work hard and go again because you know the excitement you get from making them laugh. It's an unhealthy treadmill, but at the end of that treadmill, there is this incredible cherry. That's what happiness is. Figure out a healthier way of being the best you without it being so draining to realize what you have. There will always be sort of shimmering lights of hope in, in the misery, but sometimes somebody has to help you find them. When he died, it was just this sledgehammer to your heart where you just go, Jesus, one of the, one of the, one of the good souls isn't here anymore. Russell Howard. I've watched Russell Howard on TV for years and years and years. And of all the podcasts I've done, Russell and this conversation was the most stark difference between the person I've seen on TV and the person I had a conversation with today. I think your mind is going to be blown. He's got a new Netflix show coming out called Lubricant. And the reason it's called Lubricant is because he believes comedy and laughter is the lubricant that allows us to deal with the pain of life. And we talk about the pain of his life. We talk about everything. And in this conversation, there's more tears. Recently, I did an episode on this podcast with Jimmy Carr. And the resounding feedback we got was we've never seen that Jimmy Carr before. I have a suspicion. In fact, I know that people are going to say the same about this conversation. This is the Russell Howard we have never seen before. And it's an incredibly inspiring, valuable, vulnerable Russell Howard. It's the side, as a Russell Howard fan, that I wish I'd seen more of. I have a feeling you're going to be really surprised. So without further ado, I'm Stephen Bartlett, and this is The Diary of a CEO. I hope nobody's listening, but if you are, then please keep this to yourself. I'm funny because of my mum and I'm determined because of my dad. You said that, right? I did say that, yeah. I felt like that was the beginning of a riddle. <laughs> like you were sort of a golem figure. <laughs> I was trying to understand, yeah. Can you explain that to me, please? Um, my mum is a, a warm, twinkly-eyed little lady who is inadvertently funny all the time, has no idea of her power, is just naturally uh, bright and joyful. Uh, if you ever feel that you're kind of getting used to hotels and the humdrum life of, oh, here we are in another place, um, take my mum with you, separate rooms, separate rooms, and watch her reaction when she goes into a hotel room because it reminds you of how you used to be. Oh, really? Jesus like Christ, they've got kettles, they've got tea bags, look, they've got a trouser press, look. Like, she's so excited and happy by the world. And my dad is um, <laughs> a very quiet, unbelievably determined man who, you know, when we were kids, we'd sort of, he'd have us mix in cement. Um, we'd be sort of like, you know, building kind of walls with him, plastering as a kid. I remember watching my dad plaster and he was trying to keep this kind of wall up and he screamed to himself, come on, David. <laughs> and sort of even at 11, I was going, ah, that's a bit much. Um, so I have these kind of two very different uh, dominant personalities that kind of raised me, who I love dearly both, but they are very, very different, you know. Mm. Like my dad challenged me to a press-up competition recently <laughs> um, at a family barbecue, and he beat me. He did um, 68. <laughs> you uh, He did, yeah. And he's uh, uh, 65 years old. And, uh, yeah, I remember this story. This sums my dad up. Um, I had a school report when I was 11 and the teacher said, um, what Russell needs to know is that he can't do everything. And I, I kind of go home and, you know, that moment you give the report and your dad looks and he goes, well, what does this mean? You go, well, the teacher says I, I can't do everything. He goes, why do you say that? I, I just think that I can. I think I can do anything if I put my mind to it. And my dad goes, you've got to go down that school now and tell her that. So I have to walk back to the school. You're joking. Yeah. And I kind of go in and go, my dad says I can do anything and you're not allowed to say that I can't. Which is a pretty, you know, incredible thing to do. But, you know, it made school tough. 
<laughs> so yeah, very different. What about brothers and sisters? Uh, I have a, a brother, uh, Daniel, who's an amazing human being, very funny. Um, um, and I have a sister who is an actress who's uh, also incredible. Um, they're very different as well. Um, I'm very close to my brother, not so much to my sister. We sort of, all my brother, we just played football together as kids. And oddly, Kerry is in the same world as me now and is kind of a BAFTA nominated actress. She was in um, wow. Him and Her, BBC Three, mm -hmm. and su super talented and yeah, a great human being. They're, they're, we're, they're a lovely bunch, but very strange, my family. It's like being in a Pogue song when you go to <laughs> kind of Christmas parties around our way. Do you know what I mean? Do you have, yeah. it's sort of, you know, those like, I remember weirdly the funeral of my nan and granddad, um, it was separate. Sounded like they, it was packed, <laughs> um, but but um, that feeling sometimes when you go to a funeral and you're so proud to have the same blood as the people in the room, mm. I kind of feel that whenever I'm back with my family in the West Country, there's there's such a lunacy and energy to them that I adore and feel so kind of delighted to be part of. You know, mm. that's kind of yeah. Um, Jimmy Carr said something to me which I've been waiting to ask another comedian. There's a stereotype that comedians are funny because they're depressed. Yeah. But Jimmy Carr said that's wrong. He said, you've really got to ask a comedian who in their family is sick. Mm. Um, because he says that much of his comedic genius or his desire to please people came from um, trying to make a family member happy or trying to ease moments of tension in the family dynamic mm. when he was younger. Um, do you resonate with that at all? Yeah, yeah, completely. Um, that... My dad, my dad is, you know, is successful and super serious, but used to lose his mind watching kind of Billy Connolly or watching Have I Got News For You. So he would like howl with laughter. And we sort of figured out the way to break dad's serious energy was to make him laugh, you know. So definitely it was kind of, there's no tension if people are like, I've got a line in my new special, which is laughter is the lubricant that makes life livable. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you know, it really, it soothes tensions and it's a bandage that gets over cracks, definitely, you know. And then it's sort of <clears throat> this thing that you, when you discover you're, you, you know, you can make people laugh, it's so addictive and you can literally create your own energy. And like you do an arena, there's 15,000 people there, you're orchestrating this almost societal orgasm where th th they're kind of like lost in laughter together. It's, you, you feel like a necromancer, man. It's the best. And I think Jim's right in that th th that initial spark comes from probably, I'm thinking of other comedians as well as myself. It's sort of that sense of, you know, like I've got a lazy eye. So that was, a you know, uh, so I became funny to deflect and did jokes about my eyes to get, to stop people looking at them. And then you kind of realize, you go, okay, this is kind of cool. Or if you're a bit thick or if you're not good at football or you don't fit in, you can kind of sort of rebrand yourself in a strange way through humor. And then you, yeah. can, you can create your own kind of energy. That sounds kind of wanky, but do you know what I mean? Of course I do. Because there's, there's also another stereotype, which is that people who are <clears throat> slightly, um, slightly bigger tend to be really bubbly and have funny personalities in the right. comedians as well, which is, would fit that kind of idea that, that it's a, it's a tool of deflection yeah. from something else, you know, they don't want them to focus on or, mm. um, you talk about it being linked, heavily linked to self-esteem as well. And you're. Yeah. You yeah. Know. Well, what's odd, the further you get into it, you realize that it's so much fun doing stand up, Um, and it's such a wild drug effectively, because you're doing this, Massive gigs, about 2,000 people and everyone's laughing or 15,000 people or you're in New York, you're doing a gig in Finland and it, you, you can't quite get over it. And then as a consequence, it's quite hard to sit down and watch the TV and be normal. And um, so you're kind of chasing that sort of high. And it's about the real, the real skill is trying to figure out the sort of work-life balance, you know. Mm. I'm speaking to somebody who's... Uh, house is above yeah. work but do you know what i mean it's like see the only the only way around it is to sort of integrate it really but that, like i don't know i've been doing stand-up since i was 18 i remember doing the first gig and it felt like it was you sort of 
discovered a mechanism through which you can do life, that everything, sad, good, happy, weird, peculiar, can go through this sausage maker. And you can then uh, understand life, figure it out. But also that's a very strange way to to do it because you, you, you're, you know, you're using the stage to kind of um, uh, dissect yourself. But the aim is always funny. But I don't know of a better way to do it than to kind of make sense of the world. And the funny thing about all comics is guaranteed if they find themselves in a strange situation, sometimes a heartbreaking situation in life, there's always a little part of your brain going, it could be a bit in this. And it's that horrible sort of, you know, sort of disease that we have <laughs> that you can't ever truly be there because there's always a little bit of you, whether you're Seinfeld or, you know, Taylor Tomlinson or Bill Burr or Chappelle or whatever, your brain is going, yep, there's stuff in this. Do you know what I mean? As you're having the, as you're getting beaten up or whatever, your brain, I remember getting mugged in Brighton when I was 18 and, and this, this guy shouted at me, come back, I'm a police officer. He clearly wasn't. And I said, no, you're not, you're a monster. And as I said it, I went, yeah, that's gonna be quite funny, I reckon. <laughs> like, but I'm literally running away and terrified, but my brain's going, yeah, I'll probably build a little bit about that. And it's, I think all, all comics that I know have that thing where reality is always auditioning to find its way into your set. Wow. I could uh, I could get out of hand and you could start willing misfortune. This is the weird thing. Yeah, well, the, but well, exactly. But it's that's the problem. But yeah, we haven't got any jokes or anything. You're just walking around dressed as a clown, going to like a fucking zoo. <laughs> There's got to be something in this. But yeah, you're right. It's but it, it's sort of about keeping life open a bit and keeping the third eye open. Really, probably that's the same of all creatives, where you kind of you, you or all people really like you have to notice the thing the things that niggle you. And if you're talking about them, whether it's, you know, like in my last special, I had a big bit about kind of young women self-harming. I couldn't, I was like, what? Like one in four women self-harm. And I was like, I couldn't get my head around that. And I just knew I had to talk about it on stage. And yesterday I saw this lady complaining because the foam in her cup wasn't at the top of her cup. And I, for the rest of that morning, I couldn't, I couldn't get my head around it. Just how do you get the confidence to complain about your foam mm. not being there? And I know somehow that's going to end up in a show somewhere. That's the way I kind of operate, really. I sort of see these little things or, and they kind of, I make a note on my phone and they gradually kind of make their way, you know? Interesting. Mm. It's like collecting dots from society and then figuring out later how they form. Well, I think that, I know Chris Martin does a similar thing where you just make little notes for, of lyrics and Woody Allen does a similar thing. Woody Allen will just write a load of stuff. And then he puts it in a um, uh, a drawer. And then when he comes to write a film, he just gets the drawer out, em empties all these notes that he's been making for the last six months and figures out what the film's going to be. And I've, wow. that's a lot easier than sort of writing from a blank page because you can then finesse your kind of thoughts in the field when you're in the laboratory, as mm. it were. You said something there which I find really interesting and I think is there's kind of... Um, almost analogies for life within, which is after you've come off stage to thousands of people in an arena, yeah. you then go home and have to like sit in front of the TV. Yep. The, the anti-climax, dealing with like that consistent high, then low, it feels like a lot emotionally because that's mm. like a huge adrenaline surge. And then even like physiologically, that it feels like that must be non, not natural Yeah, have a consequence. Yeah, Christ, that's deep. And let's hope it doesn't. But yeah, you're right. It's, it's, yeah, it, it, every comedian, when they're in the middle of a tour, needs a really, really good box set. Mm. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? It's like mm. you need succession, you, you need madmen, you need something to get you through. Because, yeah, it's sort of otherwise, like, if you're trying to maintain that high, um, you know, if you're sort of drinking and you're doing drugs or whatnot, it's going to make it harder to be mm. that version. It's kind of like, whereas if you're a musician, you can still sing the song that they want you to sing if you're on kind of coke or like, or you're pissed up. It's kind of hard to be a good comic for a long time mm. if you're kind of, you know, on drink and drugs. So yeah, you have to sort of develop this kind of way of like reintegrating your life. But also it's nonsense as well. It's just, it's it's fun make-believe. Like, 
and 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 also what's important is kind of you know going for a meal with your wife and 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 hanging out and seeing friends and and there's joy in that you know and you see it's you, you you have to you have to try you have to plan fun i think that that's the crucial thing you have to go and right we'll go on holiday and we'll go to that restaurant and we'll watch this film because i think like you say it's the sitting and the and the waiting is very difficult to compete with the the innate rush that you get from stand up because of what you do professionally do you find it harder to enjoy the sitting and the waiting and the meal where you're sat there just you know and the holiday where you're sat on the deck chair not like i normally what i love about holidays is, i don't know what your feelings are about them but by the end of like 10 days i'm ready to go back to my life because holidays remind me of how much i love my life and that's the thing. So you need to have that kind of, I'm a real sit in the sun, you know, read some books, um, listen to podcasts, whatever, and then kind of go again. But I like the recharge of it. If there was a, if there was a thing where you could literally plug yourself in like a mobile phone, I would happily do that on a beach. Do you know what I mean? And then right. kind of go again. But I'm not really a, when I'm in holiday mode, I'm not really a culture vulture. I'm kind of a sit down, plonk, book, sun, relax get ill because I've been putting it off. Do you know what I mean? Your body just kind of gets a bit sick and then you kind of go again. How about you? Do you, are you a relaxer? Uh, I think I'm a forced relaxer. Right. Yeah. I think my girlfriend is the reason why I would go on holiday. And I think she's also the reason why I would be present on holiday. And right. she's the reason why I'd go and look at like a castle or something. Okay. But a I castle? Think, like whatever she would want to look at. But okay. I think if it was just up to me, I wouldn't go and I yeah. wouldn't do it. And even if I did go, I wouldn't leave the hotel room. Yes. There's like strong evidence for that because whenever I've gone to speak in a country or whatever, I don't leave the hotel room. I yeah. have no desire to do anything but just be on my phone or laptop. So it's pretty sad, but I think, it, you know, that's why it's fortunate that I have a girlfriend. Yeah, but it's also that thing as well of like you clearly, with the job you do, you clearly love it as well. I love it, yeah. So that's the thing. If you're fortunate enough, there are so many, there are billions of people who are, who are, who, you know, Live for the weekend. You do mm. your job, punch in. Job you don't like, get your money, s smash your weekend, try and find your fun. If you're one of the, there are so few people in this world that truly have a thing that they do, that they get paid for, that they adore. You just got to get hold of it, man. And mm. just like, there's no shame, but it just seems peculiar to the outside. So, so you got to be how obsessed you, you get about your job or I would get about stand up or there was a documentary about the comedy store um, on uh, Sky recently and I watched it. It was incredible. It was a beautiful kind of summer's day and I smashed the whole thing. It's one of the best days I've ever had in my life because it was incredible and it evoked this kind of the comedy store from the sort of the 70s and the 80s and Jay Leno and all this. And it just, you know, I was like, we need a time machine. We need to go back to, to those times at the comedy store. But it's because I love stand-up and I kind of, you know, it, it's, you have to be with people that understand your passions because you can't fake it. You can't go, let's go to the castle if you're not a go to the castle guy. Do you know what I mean? But you're right, you can be, you can have help to look at the castle. Yeah. And, and then understand. you realise when you get to the castle, that is a really nice castle. Yeah. I wouldn't have come had you not dragged Completely. Me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we're you, not staying for ages at the castle. Right? <laughs> yeah, I don't want to, yeah, yeah. it's not an Airbnb. Um, but you start writing, so on that point of finding your passion and pursuing it, you started writing jokes at 14? Yeah. Why wow, you done your research? Yeah. Yeah, wow. I had an old computer and uh, yeah, I kind of, I watched a Lee Evans video with my mate, my mate Craig um, and uh, it blew my mind because when I was a kid, stand-up really wasn't on TV, that you'd have like a Billy Connolly tape, uh, you'd have like, have I got news for you? It was a big show or Bottom or uh, um, Shooting Stars, it was that kind of era. But stand-up wasn't really a thing um, and he was the first sort of person that I'd seen who kind of was just funny, wasn't an alpha. And I was like, wow, he like, it was mind blowing. I, just felt, I think I could be, f I, that's sort of a bit like how I'm funny. Like, you know what I mean? And um, me and Craig just wore that tape out. We just watched it over and over and over. And, um, and I didn't tell anyone about it. I just started writing these little kind of jokes and routines and ideas mm. that um, none of which were any good, but it just became like my little, it was like my little fun place to go to every so often goes, well, I'm going to write some of my jokes. 
Did you perform them to anybody at that age? My first ever gig was in Bristol, a place called Virgin Murph. And I took all these jokes that I've been writing since I was 14 and I whittled it down to my best 20. And uh, I did it there at Virgin Murph. I followed a guy uh, who was eating a banana with a spoon, <laughs> singing the theme tune to the Sweeney. Um, and uh, another bloke that was sort of like, his act was to punch himself in the face. So in a sense, it didn't really matter how bad my 14 <laughs> year old stuff was. Um, but yeah, so that was it. And then I kind of, some of it stuck, some of it didn't, but it was all like, I had this bit about like, how did Captain Kirk get through the entire, I wrote this when I was 14, <laughs> but how did Captain Kirk get through all the Star Trek episodes without once flicking Spock's ears? So that was one of my first, so, and I sort of think it's all right. It's not bad. It's <laughs> not bad. But, yeah, but, you've come but that was the first joke I ever kind of told. And one of the things I found quite peculiar in your story is that your, your dad your, um, really pushed you to give comedy a go. Yeah. And that, that seems, I, of all the guests I sit here with, the thing that has typically made them um, famous or well-known or successful, yeah. they, th their parents were usually quite against it and would much rather have them got a quote-unquote real job. Yes. So uh, what were you doing at the time? Um, and yeah, why, why was your dad supportive of it when, you know, at a time when that's probably not considered a highly profitable, high chance of success career. Yeah. I was working at the RAC in Bristol. I had a part-time job. Um, and I was also doing stand-up. And I, because I started stand-up at university and then finished my degree, went home and uh, <clears throat> was just kind of doing probably three gigs a week for, you know, 50 quid a pop or like sometimes a hundred quid a pop, that kind of thing. And um, uh, alongside this kind of like shift at the RAC. And it was, I was kind of like, I'd have a gig in Lincoln and then I'd have to drive back to get to work. And it was, it was kind of like knackering. And my dad basically, I remember weirdly not to name drop, but I was talking to Matthew McConaughey about this. And it's a very similar thing where his dad, when he told his dad he wasn't going to become a lawyer, he was going to become a comedian, he, um, um, an actor. His dad said, don't half ass it. And that was a similar reaction to my dad. My dad basically was like, right, if you want to do this, you're 21, go for it. Give yourself a year. Don't stop. Put everything into it. And then if, if it's not happening in a year, you stop, you get a proper job. And I kind of, I, I really respected that option that he gave me. Do you know what I mean? It was like, I'll be fine. It was like, don't fuck around, properly go for it. Don't do three gigs a week, do five gigs a week. Just do that and then see where you are in a year. And um, I was at the Edinburgh Festival. I had about like eight days left from this kind of like contract. And uh, my now agent saw me at the Edinburgh Festival have like a really good gig. And he kind of said, oh, does it always go that well? And I was like, all oh, the time, you mad, yeah. Um, but it was, I was doing lots of sort of improvising and stuff like that. It was quite hit and miss back then. And then we went for a, went for a meal. He gave me, they used to have a, a thing called the Comedy Network where it was like 30 gigs around universities. And that day he booked me into these 30 gigs that were at the time, I still remember the money. It's 150 pounds per gig spreading out into November. And, but to work for um, a comedy company called Avalon, one of the biggest kind of comedy producers in the in the UK. And then he signed me. And so it, it worked. And then I kind of moved to London and kind of, you know, slowly kind of kept on keeping on. I really, I liked the deadline that my dad gave me. Do you know what I mean? Because it was kind of, and I, re, I re, really respected it. And he, the, he had this amazing quote on his office that that said something like, I think it's by T.E.T.S. Eliot or T.E. Eliot that said, those who dream by night in the dusty recesses of their mind wake in the day to find that all is vanity, but the dreamers of the day are dangerous for they act upon their visions with open eyes and make them happen. And that is at the core of my dad. So he's kind of quite disciplined, but he also has a fuck it, go for it. But yeah, I just went for it. But also because I loved it and I didn't love working at the RSC and I didn't, I'd finished my degree and I knew what I wanted to do. And I just, I just worked my bollocks off, man. I did every gig you can imagine, but loved it. And my brother used to come to them. We traveled down to Brighton to do 10 minutes. And, 
you know, we'd, we'd have to sort of bunny hop the car to Reading Station because we didn't fill up. And, you know, it was, it was real kind of fly by the seat of your pants stuff, but just the best. It was the best. It was like, it's the best night out. You go to Plymouth and, you, you know, it's a six hour round journey, but you do 20 minutes and it goes great. And then the promoter says, oh, we'll get you back. And you're like, brilliant. I go back to Plymouth, you know, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, it sort of all worked out. Something is so interesting when, when I speak to successful comedians because it's one of the like purest forms of like in, insanely, I say insanely, but like if you were trying to reach a lucrative outcome, one of the like insane paths, uh, one of the most insane pure followings of one's passion because it, it seems, seems to be the case that you follow your this passion which doesn't promise to ever pay you that well yeah. or promises no chance of success and you follow it for years yeah. being paid 50 quid 100 quid yeah and then i mean i speak to the ones that were successful right yeah. but w- when you look back on that period of your life do you, and, and if i was to say well, like what are the what are the key things you've just, you've identified hard work as one of them yeah. but what are like the key things that made you get here when so many won't get here hard work luck, um, natural talent, um, perspiration. Mm. Um, um, but mostly, and I would say luck is a big thing. Luck and hard work are the big, big ones. And, and taking your opportunity and having little kind of moments and always listening to the crowd as well, because it, it's sort of that thing where certainly as a live comedian, you can't bullshit people. Like th- there is, you get a tangible answer every time. The laughter is yes, the silence is no. Y- you just can't fuck with that. Like that's, that is the, there is a truth mm. to the to the gig. <laughs> if, if they're laughing, it's fine. If they're not, it ain't. Mm. And that's the big thing really. It's just kind of, you know, all great comedians listen to the audience because they're all that matters. And y- you can be critically lauded, you can be, um, you can win awards, you know, but ultimately if, if you don't hear laughter, you won't be here. And it's, and you have to have new stuff. That's the big thing. You have to, you have to make them laugh and constantly, constantly renew yourself. That's the thing, Mm -hmm. um, to kind of, to stick around. You make the audience laugh. They all burst out laughing. They clap. They say, oh, you're amazing after the gig. They say, we're going to rebook you. You're the best person ever. Does that impact your self-esteem in a positive way? Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Imagine that. But yeah, it's like, yeah, it's the best, man. It's just, but that feeling when you do the Brighton Comedia and you're 20 and you do 10 minutes and it goes really well. And Stephen Grant, who is still the booker at the Brighton Comedia, says, oh, we'll get you back for a 20. That journey home, that's the best. Or someone says, oh, are you going to do the, we're going to get you back to uh, to host uh, the Lincoln student night. And you're like, yeah, do you want to do it monthly? Yes. And you build up this like little following in Lincoln because it's, it, it, it's, it's, of course, your self-esteem is just up there because you feel like you're a youth team footballer that's breaking into the first team. That's how it must feel like. You feel like you're kind of Phil Foden and you get these little opportunities it's probably a similar thing with footballers, like what makes Phil Foden probably that he has natural talent, he works his ass off. And when there's opportunities, he's kind of clinical enough to take advantage of them. Do you know what I mean? And learn from mistakes. That's the And comedy is, is constantly about learning from mistakes because you go, you do new material, it doesn't work, you, you tweak it, you tweak it, you tweak it until you get something that, that, that kind of makes them laugh. We, we, one would then assume that comedians have like just tremendously high self-esteem. If they're laughing, yeah. But then what the, the interesting as well is how quickly it crumbles down if it goes badly. And I've got a friend of mine, Al Pitcher, who's a comic in Sweden, and we talk about this a lot, where when you're low, it, irrespective of what you've done before, you just feel like, like such deep, deep shame that you've been unable to kind of make them laugh. Um, but then that makes you work hard and go again because you know the excitement you get from making them laugh. So it's this, it's an unhealthy treadmill, but at the end of that treadmill, there is this incredible cherry. Deep, deep shame. Just because it's embarrassing. It's like you've, you've tried to make, like even this, 
I'm really enjoying this. Mm. It's really fun, but it's very serious. And we've got like mm. a little mini audience over there I can hear. And every little laugh, my brain's going, oh, that's good. And when they're not, I'm like, oh, fucking hell. Really? Just yeah, totally. Just because you sort of feel like, you know, it's sort of that weird thing for me. Laughter is truth and victory and silence is failure. But then the interesting thing about that is when you watch a performance, you actually realize that of, of another comic, you go, wow, there's real power in the silence, actually. Which took me a long time to realize because I was very initially, like, brr, 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 just keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. And then you kind of, you know, you, you watch someone like Chappelle, um, for example, and you go, he's a real master of the silence and you don't, you're not, you don't lose him. Do you know what I mean? And you're not away, you're captivated. But it takes a really long time to feel that you've earned the right to captivate an audience. But yeah. there's captivation in silence. But who fucking thinks they're captivating? That's the hardest thing I find is to kind of, you can never know whether you've been captivating or dull <laughs> because the sound is the same. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's yeah, sort yeah, of that yeah. weird thing of like, I mean, I don't come off stage going, was that captivating or dull? Yeah, yeah. Um, but hopefully, yeah. It's really interesting. So when, when you have conversations like this, because there is no, like, there's not huge amounts of laughter because it's a serious conversation. Oh, but I love chats like this. This is really? the best, man. But yeah, go on. I was, that's what I was basically asking was, um, it's, it, when, we, when we have comedians come here, we've had Russell Kane, we've had obviously Jimmy Carr. Um, they do make a lot of jokes. Yeah. Uh, you, even before we're filming, I think, you know, Jack will like put the microphone close to Jimmy Carr's mouth. And I think he said something like, um, just keep it like a fist away. And he said, that's what your mother said. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah. And it, it's almost like a, um, a Tourette's of humor, which yeah. is, and I wonder how you kind of get through life like that. And it almost feels like uncontrollable. Yeah, you. honestly, that is the best description of it. Like there's a joke that I think sums up comedians' brains the best by a brilliant comedian called uh, Mitch Hedberg. He, he's uh, no longer with us. One of the greatest comedians of all time. And th this joke sums up the brain that comedians have. Where, and I'll do his impression. If there's fans of Mitch out there, forgive me for this. But it works better if you try and do it as him. He kind of goes, I mumble, man. I mumble a lot off stage. I'm a mumbler. So I'll be with my friend and I'll, I'll say something and he'll be like, what? And I'll say it again a little bit louder. And he'll be like, I didn't hear you. And then the third time I'll say it and he still can't hear me. So I'll say it to him. But now I'm yelling at him, that tree is far away. <laughs> and that's what it is. It's this thing in his head that's gone, oh, the tree's far away. And he, he, it's a joke about the mania. Like, what were you about? I was just saying that tree's over there, look, but it's not. It's further away. Than, and it's that thing. The amount of times I've been with my, my wife and you sort of say something. And she's like, what the fuck are you about? Just, like, I saw this bin in Primrose Hill the other day that genuinely said, protect um, our birds. So this was the line on the bin. Protect our birds. There's a picture of like a, a, a bird and respect their way of life. And I just went into this thing of like, I don't know how you show respect to a fucking, but like in my head, I'm just kind of like, I didn't know there were disgruntled chaffinches all over Primrose Hill. I've never seen that on the news of just kind of going, today a bird was the victim of, of uh, you know, of, of, of somebody attacking him. And my brain was just like whirring around with this. And she can see I'm I'm kind of full zombie eyes, just gone. <laughs> she said, what are you on about? I go, oh, that fucking bin. And it, it's sort of that, that's kind of the, the way that comics brains are, I think, that you, you spend a lot of time playing around in your head. Um, and then you kind of go, oh, that, that might be something, you know? Mm -hmm. Like we were the other day, um, I was talking to a friend about sperm donors and somebody had had, uh, there was this website and on that you could sort of get, you could get your batch. And it's, one of them was like, um, uh, you know, he was like six foot four, Swedish, keen reader, and um, you're a really good job. And you're like, yeah, that's exactly what I'd say if I was trying to flog spunk. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You're not going to kind of go, bit, bit of a loner, <laughs> comes in every Wednesday, we've had to it. stop him. But, but my point being, we were having a chat about sperm doning and my brain was sort of off in this sort of fantasy land. Where's the bit kind of like? What, yeah. what, but I just found it so funny that I don't know any true six foot four, 
high achieving intellectuals that kind of just going to nip out to a spaff into a pot. Yeah, yeah, Do you know yeah. what I mean? It doesn't exist. But so everyone's Tinder, Tinder buyer. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But, but the point is you, you spend a lot of time in that kind of fun zone. Um, and that, I think that's the brain that a lot of comics have. Speaking of that brain spiraling, mm-hmm. where after you've done a gig or, you know, can you remember a time where you, you like go on Google, you go on the Daily Mail or something, you Twitter and you look at articles of what people are saying of you mm-hmm. and it has a really profound like negative impact on your, what you think about yourself and you start to question yourself. I don't do it. Like I, I came up in the days of uh, MySpace and whatnot. And that was, I've never been on Twitter. I've never been on Facebook. Um, uh, I do a bit of Instagram. It's the same with reviews. It's a very funny thing. You get a five-star review and your brain's like, exactly. Yep, correct. You get a shitty review and you're like, what the fuck? And you realize that you have to pay no heed to it. The only, I mean, it's flattering and it's great and it's lovely to get nice reviews and anyone who says otherwise is bullshitting. But it's with social media, you, you, you can't, it's too much to kind of seek validation from people, particularly in the world that we live in at the minute, where you're having to check to see if you've been correct. For, you're not going to be right for everybody. And, and some people will not like a joke or some people suit, you know, you just have to try and stay where you, stay where you are. So I, I've definitely had times like that when I was younger and it just crushes you. And you realize actually all I'm doing is paying attention to the really negative things that people say. Um, and there'll be like, you know, one out of 50 that's super horrible um, rather than focusing on on the kind things. And you realize actually my brain focuses on the negative and you go, yeah, they're right. Actually, yeah, 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 yeah I am that. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, correct, correct, correct. And it just doesn't make me uh, a better, more functional human being. It just, it hurts. So I don't do it. Do you know what I mean? So I just kind of... But people must have said to you, your agents, your manager said, oh, get on Twitter, that'll help. Yeah, well, what what I do and what I love about social media is I like making things and then putting it on there. And so putting clips of stand-up or the TV show or whatever. But I I, I, I don't, I'm lucky. I have a, I, if I want to do comedy, I can go to a comedy club mm. and it's a dark room and I can howl or I can scream or I can be silly. I can do whatever I want. It's in a comedy club. Social media is the worst comedy club in the world mm. because people aren't there to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Everyone there is there to laugh. And there's this sort of lovely bonding experience. We're here for a reason. Whereas social media, some people, most people in the world are just up for a hoot. But some people are, are, are looking to be, to be angry or they're looking to be enraged. So it just seems naive to put humor into such a volatile club. Can you imagine if, you, if it was a club called Twitter, right? Hey, do you want to come play Twitter? Can you imagine how hard that comedy club would be? Mm. Do you know what I mean? And th- so I just don't, I don't bother with it, but I like making things that are finished and then putting them out. But I kind of literally email them to my agent then say, oh, we should put this bit from the show on. I don't even know. Wow. Well, I haven't got my logins. I don't know. Really? Anything. Yeah, yeah. What just a nice because- way to live. Yeah, but, 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 and also maybe it's because I'm 41 and I kind of came up in an era where stand-up was still playing clubs. If you're, if you're a young guy now, um, it must be completely different. And there's loads of kind of great comics that have kind of come up through social media um, or through podcasts. And I love that because there's particularly podcasts, I think with like young comics, there's a real air of punk about it mm-hmm. where you kind of go in, I'm not going to wait for TV to give me anything. I'm going to make my own thing. And then people gravitate to that. And, uh, and it's, it, that's your thing. And, and you, you can't mess with that. Whereas, I love that. I love the fact that people aren't going to be waiting for TV to anoint them. But I was very lucky that I was just doing live gigs. And then when I was 26, after having done stand-up since I was 18, somebody said, do you want to go on TV? And I kind of went the traditional path, as it were, and kind of social media grew alongside it. But I was never, and I never needed it. Which is not to say I couldn't have been bigger if I cultivated it. But the content I like making exists in the club and it's finished when I do a Netflix special or it's finished when I do a TV show. It's in, it's in a state of flux when I'm in a comedy club. Um, it's in a constant state of becoming. And the problem with social media, it makes everything finite and tangible. 
And sometimes it's not. Sometimes jokes evolve or routines evolve. If you put it out there, it, it might be rubbish or it might be ill-conceived. It might upset people. But by the end of it, having worked in it in a comedy club, it might say exactly what you want it to say. It's a, it's a really sort of sort of holy space, the comedy club v versus, versus Twitter. Why should you drink your? We're going into the fourth quarter of the year. Diets are dropping off. We're becoming lazier and lazier. And what tends to happen when, we, when our diets dip and we, we start to become less um, compelled to go to the gym is, yeah, we get out of shape, we start to feel low energy, we start to binge eat bad things. And Huel is the antidote. It's nutritionally complete. So you get everything you need for your diet in a drink. You get your 20 grams of proteins, you're gonna get your 26 vitamins and, vitamins and minerals. It's low sugar, high in fiber. It really is the cure to a lot of the health issues that we see in our personal lives, but in wider society. If you've never tried it, all I'll ask you to do is give it a try. And if you're like me, then you will like the world berry ready to drink. You'll like the mac and cheese, which is just selling like absolutely cr crazy, unsurprisingly. Um, you'll like the cinnamon and you'll like the banana flavor. Those are my recommendations. I know a lot of people love the chocolate flavor. Let me know, try it, get yourself healthy and send me a message on Instagram. Tag me on Instagram as well on your stories if you do drink, try it out because I, I sometimes upload those tags and let me know which is your favorite flavor. Can't wait to hear from you. As a comedian, do you ever feel a sense of imposter syndrome? Yeah, I think I don't know any great comic that doesn't. I'm talking to Billy Connolly. Billy Connolly used to get nervous. E Billy Connolly was worried that the audience wouldn't love him, that he wasn't worth the, their evening. Billy Connolly. If Billy Connolly is thinking that, then, you know, you know all of us are. And it's, I think if you get to that stage where you're like, this is going to be great. I know it's going to be great. It probably won't. You have to have a healthy degree of, of, of imposter syndrome in order to be the best version of yourself. Because you have to kind of, you know, you have to burst into that party and be the best, funniest you because that's what's on the ticket. That's the, the thing. And the only way to do that is kind of hard work, you know. Um, but to, to, to just rock up, for example, to an arena tour, having done no kind of warm ups, it'll be fine. It fucking won't. Arrogance destroys stand up. You kind of have to, you have to go to small clubs before you start doing a tour to kind of know you're okay to get rid of that. And without imposter syndrome, you, uh, you don't grow as an artist. Do you know what I mean? But it can be deal tough to deal with psychologically, right? Because it's, it, 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 it sounds like it must be similar to living with a sense of like self-scrutiny, which can be quite unhealthy. I don't, I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, I guess the, the key thing is to, you've got to, I think you have to leave on, on your own terms. Do you know what I mean? As in stop, there's a, there's a while where this won't be healthy forever because it's a it is a strange way to live with that. Do you feel that? You feel like it won't be? Yeah, yeah just because forever. you just kind of go, there would just come a time where you're, you're just, you're not as sharp as you once were and you're like, ah, fine, I'll just go work in local radio. But like, like not to, that's not a, a dig at anyone in local radio, you do important stuff, keep those weather checks coming. <laughs> but doing kind of arenas for a long time is, you know, I've been doing them since like, 2012 now and that is a crazy level of pressure because you sort of do we do i do them in like a month-long block in the uk and it, it's kind of whew, right okay yeah you know and then you get through it and then you're like okay go again go again and that isn't necessarily the healthiest way to be forever does it have mental health implications on you because like if you're living with that kind of internal fluctuation all the time and yeah. that anticipation that those feelings of self-doubt that you know they say that anxiety in particular is like concern about the future mm. if you're constantly thinking about the future that moment in that arena is do you feel anxious at all well the funny thing is the only time you don't feel anxious is when you're doing the uh when you're doing stand-up but weirdly that's the that's the respite um but the leading up to it, it's nerve wracking. But as soon as you step on the uh, on the stage, you kind of you know exactly what you're going to do, and it's fun. It's the most fun in the world. And then it's the but the leading up to it, 
and the afterwards, was that all right? Was that fine? It was good, right? Fine. fine. You know, I think you sort of just make your peace with it. And you, like you say, it's, it's meant, it leaves you mentally fragile, but I don't know of another way of doing it. Have you, you, do you, have you suffered with anxiety though? Oh people? yeah, massively. I like it sort of, but I think it's sort of that thing, like, right, I have these gigs, if I don't do this work, I'm going to look like a fool. People are going to boo me. There's going to be anger, blah, 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 blah. So you go, so that fear drives you to write and perform and get a show that's good enough, right? And I've not found anything that was a useful motivator. But like you say, it's a tough way of, of being. Like Johnny Wilkinson, I remember seeing this about him. Johnny Wilkinson kicked the uh, winning, um, I don't know rugby, but the winning- World Cup kick. World Cup kick, yeah, yeah right. Um, and as the ball sort of soared over, apparently he said to himself, his brain went, you nearly missed that. As it went over, like, and he's won the World Cup. And the next day he was training and he was kicking goals again to ensure that he didn't make that mistake. And unfortunately for him, that's what makes him magnificent. You know what I mean? And, it, and I think it's sort of that thing where you go, the older you get, you can try and adapt it and try and figure out, And you know, and we're all in a constant state of becoming as regards to our sort of mental health and trying to um, figure out a healthier way of being the best you without it being so draining. But he scored the winning goal the World Cup, you know, and it's sort of, it's kind of shitty, but he, but, but that, that determination is what sort of made him. And it's kind of, I guess the thing is, it's about kind of ensuring that you have enough kindness to yourself around that so that you kind of give yourself a break from time to time. And that the overall picture is happy. That, yeah, yeah. But, but, but I don't know of a, a better motivator than fear to make good stuff. I, like if it if it exists, I mean, do what do you, can you recognise that? Do you have the, what what is there another thing that you have? I, I guess excitement. If you could turn fear into excitement, that would be a healthier way of doing it. Yeah. But I just don't find it as oh yeah, it's yeah. so much fun because we'll go yeah. there and it's gonna be great. But then you wouldn't do the prep, right? As you say, if I, if I was excited, I wouldn't. I'd probably neglect. Doing well, that would be the thing. So that so you'd have like six months of joy, yeah, and then you'd do the thing. It'd be fucking Shit. awful. <laughs> and then, whereas at least this way, you have six months of tension, mm. and then you have joy, and then the kind of joy lasts throughout the tour, and, and then, then after the tour, and then after the tour, you go back to fear <laughs> <laughs> to get there. But I, but I don't know. Like it's. But I, I don't have the answers and I, I, I don't know what works for other people. But for me, it is that. And it's something that I'm trying to address. Which but part? It's, like Living in fear too much. Living in fear too much but, but, or putting too much responsibility on the thing. But I don't know of another way. Yeah. And, I, like, you know, and I'm sort of you know, seeing people and trying to figure it out. But I don't know what motivates you for example it's a, i completely get it it's a trade off right if you want to achieve yeah. the goal you need this unfortunate i always think this i think i think everything has a cost yeah um and everything good in my life that i love comes with a cost it might be it could even be a financial cost or it could be some other type of sacrifice and those that have risen the highest in certain professions it's so obvious to see the cost in their lives. It's much more obvious than everyone else. So I sit here with my guests. I sit with Eddie, Eddie Hearn. He's built the number one boxing promotion company, mm -hmm. but he never ever sees his wife and kids. Yeah. And he's like, it's like unsatisfiable as a human. Yeah. You know, that's why his book is called Relentless. And I get, well, that's the clear quote unquote cost potentially. Yeah. Um, and yeah, with what you're saying, being in an arena performer, one would think that you spend a lot of time in a certain mental place which is uh not always great yeah but then i was just thinking then i was thinking about the the fascinating thing about life is you have these so for example we did 10 nights at the albert hall oh wow which is like a world record it's mental it was extraordinary that kind of little me that used to sit in the back of mum and dad's um ford uh fiesta watching the raindrops go down the window i did 10 nights at the albert hall it was mental um, and it was fun, it was brilliant, it was great, but it was like, you're playing snooker, you know, get all the reds, 
then then they're knock the rest of them down, mm. done. You know what I mean? But it's that lovely kind of controlled snooker brain. Joke, 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 end of the show, hooray, yeah, go again, right? But it was but it was fun. That exists from a sort of a dopamine level on a very similar level as being on my stag do with my cousins in Vegas and hearing my cousin Lewis tell a story. And so I think it's wow. my way of figuring it out is to have as many of those dopamine hits of joy, whether it's good food, good company, um, travel, books, music, whatever, so that you're kind of constantly feeding yourself. Like, because if you just, that's the big realization I've had that if you only try and get happiness from work, for me, it doesn't work. To sit around and, and hope that your life outside of work can compete with this joy that you get from work. The only way you can do it is to surround yourself with people that you think are fantastic or experiences that you think are fantastic. And it can even be little things. It's just like, you know, like we, we did some gigs in Dubai and we went to a water park every day hmm. and I'm 41. And I went with my, my friends who are all big, big lads. And we were on this rubber dinghy and we kept going down this slide. We honestly, it was, it was, the joy, the silliness of the day led into the, the fun of the gig. And I remember reading a thing about Chappelle, that Chappelle, when he's on tour, he brings his pals, he brings friends along so that he's, he's sort of living. Uh, the, the joy of life is connected with the joy of work. He's never sort of sat backstage with his notepad, kind of waiting for an hour and a half to go on. And if that's something I'm trying to do, I'm trying to kind of involve people more in, in kind of work and be less mm. kind of like, you need to stay away, I need to concentrate, you know? To blend the two and you kind of- Totally. Yeah, and you talk about this as, in the same way with you, at the st a couple of moments ago, you talked about living for the week and then kind of like compartmentalizing that and then having your life on the weekend and how that doesn't feel like the best way to live either because the, you have five days of misery and yeah. then two days of like pissed, you know, getting, trying yeah. to find the- But I think also the pandemic has recalibrated a lot of people that you actually go, we were kind of locked away from each other and we were locked away from experience and the happiness of something appearing from nowhere. Those magical nights down the pub or watching football or listening to music or having a barbecue with friends where a, a moment unintentionally becomes a memory. And we were kind of robbed of those social moments that created memories because we were sat with this disease lurking, not knowing where our lives were going to become. And we kind of felt like we were sort of immune from something, this, this heavy happening to us. And it didn't, it happened to everybody. And it feels like because of that, we, we are now kind of coming out of the cave, as it were, with a real desire to um, find as much majesty in the universe as possible that, that I, I genuinely feel a lot of people like audiences post pandemic like even british audiences <laughs> who were you know by a stretch the 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 toughest crowds in the world like by a stretch really? is that that lovely english coming in can't make me laugh you know what i mean whereas like in america they're they're already up like you do comedy clubs in america they stand up as you walk in <laughs> you know what i mean and but but british crowds now because people are people want connection and they want experience because it was kind of robbed of us. So um, it feels like it could be a, a really glorious time. And like 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 you were saying with the the tour that you've got planned, what a fantastic way of doing that rather than just uh, I could just do you could just do a Q and A, but you're putting you know you're making what sounds like a really pulsating live theatre show. It's going to blow people's minds and. That's what I want to do. That's what audiences want. There's a friend of mine called Alex Edelman who said, I like stuff that's ambitious and finished. And that's kind of where I want to go. And I feel like that's where audiences want to be. They want to see something that's going to rock them, you know, and, and, and blow them away. What a target to aim for, to a thing that's going to be, I'm going to try and make a thing that's the best night out that anyone's ever had. One of the things you said was um, just a couple of moments ago was that you've seen someone to help you with uh, that kind of fear, living in fear yeah. state that we described. What do you mean by you've seen someone? Oh, just a bit of therapy to, um, yeah, try and uh, 
um, have like sort of little coping mechanisms. You know, you sort of just get, <clears throat> you get far enough into it where you go, oh, maybe just have a bit of help now um, to recognize kind of moments of mania and how to kind of manage them a bit better. So nothing super exciting. It's not a shaman mm. or, um, you know, it's not any kind of ayahuasca or, or mushrooms. It's just a bloke in a, in an office. So what was your intention when you went to bloke, <laughs> bloke in the office? Um, the... Just to kind of make it a bit easier so that you weren't loading it too much. So you can still like, you know, work if efficiently without it becoming debilitating. Because I think that's the thing probably a lot of people suffer from that by using fear as a motivator, sometimes it, you're probably losing 20% of your potential through kind of um, panic. So yeah, it was sort of, God, I sound like a fucking robot when I said that, but do you know what I mean? It was sort mm. of that thing of like, just trying to figure out, okay, is there another way of doing this? Was there? Uh, yeah. It's, but even <clears throat> recognizing when you're um, just a bit full on and just kind of go, all right, just calm down. But I'm a real sucker for like little quotes, man. Or I was weirdly, I'm interviewing Will Smith on Thursday, oh, wow. which is mad for 10 minutes. I've got a 10 oh, minute interview with Will God, Smith. I'm so jealous. They, they emailed me and said, oh, because we have the same publisher, like Will Smith's coming to town. Yeah. I was like, can I get on the podcast? He's like, he's got no time. Yeah. I'd have loved 10 minutes. Well, but this is it. Well, I'll sneak you along, man. Let's do it. Let's <laughs> yeah. see if we can double up. Well, but, but I was listening to the beginning of his book and um, it's a brilliant story about his dad made him and his uh, brother build a wall. And it's just, this, this is very, very simple analogy. You've probably read it. It's just brick by brick. And that's particularly when you're making a TV show and you're writing topical jokes. Sometimes, well, it, it's, sometimes it's really hard to make stories interesting and to write jokes about things that are going on. And in that instance this week, that really helped me brick by brick. And I'm able to kind of go, okay, yeah, cool. I can, I can get stuff from that. You know, I'm, I'm very much a, from a philosophical point of view or a therapy point of view, I need pointers and tips to make me better. I'm not a enjoy every sandwich kind of a guy because it's a fucking sandwich. Mm. Like, I, you know what I mean? Like be in the sandwich, just it's like, oh, it's just a fucking sandwich. Like I, I, I need, I'm very much kind of Eastern philosophy of like, okay, how do we how do we make ourselves better? I love the idea of kind of sort of self improvement and being the best you. Um, so I find quotes help that mm -hmm. you know, and even talking to somebody like that I am like a bit of an expert. You, you he he'll say something or you'll say something and you kind of unravel a thing. And he, even like what we're doing now, sort of having a chat about the process. And I have a, um, my friend, uh, James Bay, uh, the singer, we, particularly during, the, during, during COVID, we spoke a lot about uh, everything and about creativity and talking to like-minded individuals about the pursuit of a joke or a, or a song or a, uh, any kind of piece of art, I find really, really interesting. I love it. I'm so interested in the way that musicians create. I'm so envious because they sit in a cool room or they go to like this studio and they kind of write and they jam and they riff and they create a thing and then they perform it. Whereas the musicians I know are very envious of the way the comedians create, which is you go in front of a crowd and you create with, not for, you know. Mm. It, it would be like the comparison of like Chris Martin going in front of a crowd in Chiswick and going, it was all blue? Nope. Okay. Uh, it was all green? Nope. It was all yellow? Yellow. Right, I'll do yellow tomorrow. And it sort of is that kind of, process so talking to different creatives or anyone who is sort of an expert in managing yourself is something that i find really comforting or or you know like even i've really gone to this guy andrew huberman at the minute he's like a professor from stanford and there's all these kind of neuro-linguistic things you can do to help yourself you know, like cold showers and all this and Wim Hof breathing and all this kind of stuff. Does that stuff work for you? Maybe it's psychosomatic, but yeah, it feels like it does. Do you know what I mean? You feel like you've done your, it's like going to the gym. It just feels like medicine for you, doesn't it? You always feel like, no, no one enjoys going to the gym, uh, you know, 
I imagine Arnold Schwarzenegger did. But most people are just like, right, do it. And it feels like a nice little tick for your soul. And it just feels like therapy is almost, well, it's exactly that, isn't it? It's, it's a workout for your brain. Or having a conversation like this is a really nice workout for your brain where we're both in kind of like a strange dream-like state where we're mm. kind of having a deep conversation. Um, we're kind of riffing, but somehow without planning any of this, we're getting to a deeper mm. place. And yet it's very strange because there's people driving, listening to us right now, <laughs> which is very weird. It's eh? weird, isn't it? Do you know it? what I mean? Yeah, just it's kind so of, weird, yeah. And well, that's the fascinating thing. In the future podcast. as well. In the future, man. Yeah. And, but you're in the now, aren't you? <laughs> Derek left there but it's sort of that fascinating thing that you let people travel to work with you mm. it's the coolest yeah yeah it feels like a huge yeah you know, especially because it comes out on Monday as well yeah which is a particularly like interesting day to be yeah. in their ear at 6am yeah and yeah. it's so funny is it what yeah. are the podcasts you listen to what are your what you're going oh, to if you or do you listen to lock me up if you found out like I listen to like serial killer podcasts do you and, yeah like Theranos the trial of Elizabeth Holmes like crime and Serial killers tends to be my like go-to. Yeah. And you know what? It's actually, I probably know why now because I'm so fascinated. This is the reason why I do this podcast. I'm so fascinated by people in their psychology. And for me, criminals and serial killers are the most extreme and fascinating amongst us. So I would love to have a podcast where I could interview serial killers and be like, why did you do that? Do you know? <laughs> yeah. It's basically what I'm doing now. So, you know, yeah. but slightly different fascinations. So. Yeah. It's just, I, I get so fascinated by them. And I'm watching these serial killer documentaries, trying to understand the pattern in what made them like from their childhood and their dad said this and then kid on the playground punched them and then they just started killing people. You know? Yeah. So yeah, what about you? <laughs> sort of more fantasy football stuff, really. I enjoy um, <laughs> no, I kind of, um, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, it's because a friend of mine does one. Um, uh, I li yeah, like I listened to Tim Ferriss yeah. and Andrew uh, Huberman. Um, I, those are my go-tos. Um, Mark Maron, I really like. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so some really great interviews. Um, yeah, I love, there's a brilliant interview with Maron and Seinfeld, which is one of my favorites. Like I really got into Jerry Seinfeld during the uh, during the lockdown, which is kind of so late. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I just feel like I've gone, hey, Radiohead are good. <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, I kind of, yeah, that's my thing. I like I like hearing people that I don't know and having my mind blown. That's what I like about podcasts. I'm not into serial killer. I find it too, do you know what I mean? It too, People say that. Yeah. Too icky for me. Yeah. What do you, and you, you call yourself murderinos, don't you? Is that, is is, that what? I don't apparently know. Apparently that's the name. If you're, if you're a big really. fan, you're a murderino. Oh, really? Wow. wow. I fit in. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the things you were you're touching on there about these kind of practical hacks and quotes and stuff mm -hmm. that allow you to kind of get to a better place reminded me of something that I read about you regarding your pre- performance routine and superstitions yeah before you're going up on stage and there's you know fifteen thousand people out there and they're all got their arms folded and they're demanding you to make them laugh what are you doing backstage to get yourself in the state you're, you need to to perform at your optimal so if it's arenas we get football and we just have a kick around um really yeah yeah so we just sort of do keepy ups and you've got to do 10 before you go on stage between you, oh okay so, so me kumar and pete um, and then Steve and we'll try, we've got to do 10 keepy ups before we go on stage. You can't really do that if you're doing a small club. Um, there's a brilliant comedy club called Top Secret in, in London. And, um, it's very, very small. And before that, you, I'm literally in an alley that stinks of piss, um, looking at notes. So, so it's, it's always looking at notes, thinking what you're going to do, sort of trying to be calm to listen to that inner voice <clears throat> that says, Hey, you could also do this. And that kind of weird, kind of um, funny that just appears from nowhere. That's always the best way of starting a gig. Um, and that's it really. But there isn't really a psyching up process. I'll, I'll like watch, if I'm doing a big show, I'll watch my friend who's who's supporting me. Um, see what, get, sneak in the back of the theater or the arena and get a feel for them. And, um, and then just go for it. Why keep you ups? Is that just a tra tradition or is it like a... You no, know, it's just, it's sort of if you're, this, yeah, there's, maybe it's just that weird thing of like, right, I've done 10, I can, you know. And then if you don't do 10 the first time and it falls, you've got to do 20. And if it falls, 30. So, do you know what I mean? So you've, you have to do it. And then it becomes this weird, uh, like little thing. You just don't want that in the back of your head. You can't do a big gig going, shit, man, I only did 24 keepy-ups. 
So um, it's super superstition. Yeah. yeah, like, yeah. And I just, and I kind of like, I spend a lot of time with my tour manager, Kumar, the mighty Kumar Kamalagaran, um, and um, just chatting about stuff and just being kind of loose and sort of, yeah, just sort of getting in the zone of being silly and, and just talking about any old bollocks to try and sort of get things going or, you know, it's like if my brother comes on tour with me, that's always fun because it's kind of, there'll, there'll just be a bit of, a bit of nothing kind of happening. And like, yeah, so I like sort of just hanging out and chatting, talking bollocks and um, sort of loosening yourself up really. That's kind of what I do beforehand. This is a very, um, I don't know why this question came into my head, but you know, it tends to be the kind of things I ask on this podcast. What was the lowest moment of your life? What was the lowest moment of my life? I think when my, my, when my granddad died, that was like, I was, it was, yeah, it was awful. And I was incredibly lucky because I, how was I? I was thinking I was 36 when granddad died. And um, he, I'd never had anyone in my family. Um, what well, my cousin Shane had died when I was 18. And, um, but I'd never been to a funeral. So it was Shane and, and granddad. So there'd been this huge gap where nobody died. And, um, you know, this sort of beautiful family that I belonged to, they were all kind of there. And my granddad was sort of like unbelievably special kind of man. He was four foot nine and um, just funny and warm and j just like a quintessential granddad. But like he, he got me into football. So I used to watch football with granddad and watch match of the day. And he'd make me and Daniel toast, you know, that thick white bread. And he'd kind of like make us some granddad toast. And he's just a brilliant, brilliant soul that just was su such a big part of my life that he, and they used to come and see us quite a lot. And whenever he was there, I don't know, he, he was, you were just bathed in his love. Like him and him and my nan just adored me and I adored them. And it was, they used to have a poster of, of me on their, uh, on their wall. Um, and they used to, and nan used to keep all, all the, all the reviews I'd get. So she put them up like, and it was just that lovely thing. That was really some lovely reviews and some shitty ones too. And it was just like, nan, why are you, don't take that. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> but, but they, and they used to watch me on TV and I come from a, a family where it's inconceivable that, that I could be on TV from, from the family that I come from. It's, it's, you know, it's like going to the moon, but because Nan and Granddad used to go, we'd have watched you on a TV. Mind, we'd, we'd have watched it with the volume down, you'd have swear. So they would watch me when I was doing good news or I was on Mock the Week with the volume down. It's our wrestler on the box and just sort of see me kind of <laughs> like that. And, but they were so, through every part of my life, I, I felt utter love from my Nan and my Granddad and they were around forever. And, and, it's it's that thing where I don't know for whatever reason he was like this sage, and my there's a beautiful photo of my cousin Shane who 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 died when he was he was eighteen, and he was on a scrambler motorbike, and our granddad when we were about eight he used to look at that and just go there you go that is the bravest bloody boy you've ever seen in your life, and it was like sort of a really interesting. Um, story because he he had cancer and he died of cancer and he he went on this sort of scrambler and he did this race and he was he completed it even though he, he was really not well at all and and our granddad told that with such pride and it was this beautiful story and that's what and granddad and you knew granddad told similar stories obviously not as beautiful as that about all of us and and um yeah, when he died, it was just this sledgehammer to your heart where you just go, Jesus, one of the one of the one of the good souls isn't here anymore. And yet this is the the fascination of life. I was in Mexico and it happened, and my mum rang me up and said, Granddad's dead. And I was like, just low. <laughs> and then 
Um, literally seconds later, there was a there was a Mexican man just going da 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 da, and it was just like, "Fuck me, the universe is funny, man." Mm. So it was like utter sadness, and then somebody da 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 da, and it was um, yeah, it was just this weird like moment where you're like going, "Fucking really, really." Um, so yeah, that was the that was definitely an unbelievably low moment, and yet weirdly became his funeral, this beautiful moment where you were, like I said at the beginning, where you feel privileged to belong to the blood you belong to. You know, I've never done who do you think you are? I know who I am. I'm, you know, I know where I come from and I know my people and I feel proud to belong to those people. Um, and the funeral of my granddad was just this reminder of the excellence of my family and how proud and how much we all love each other. So from that deep sadness came this reflection of my granddad and you realize that everyone in this room were there because of his brilliance. So it was this kind of weirdly bittersweet moment, you know? Mm. And my cousin, Lew um, my cousin Stuart wore a leather jacket and looked like fucking Lovejoy <laughs> and nobody understood. And everyone's like, why are you wearing a leather jacket? Oh, we know we didn't have a suit. And we were carrying granddad in the coffin. And Daniel was like, nice jackets, Stu. And our fucking shoulders start going because it's like, you know, like, oh, mate. And everyone's like, are they going to laugh? And we're like, fucking hold it together, hold it. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, six weeks later, my nan died. And uh, it was horrific. Six and, weeks later? Yeah, six weeks later. And then we went to the... Um, went to the funeral again and Stuart rocked up with that same leather jacket and you're like, fuck me, man. And you could see everybody just looking down oh going, God. don't laugh. Why is he wearing a <laughs> fucking leather? He literally rocked up like Hasselhoff. You're like, put a suit on. But it was weirdly funny and you could hear everyone go, fuck, he's wearing a fucking leather jacket on again. I'm like, Jesus Christ, what's fucking wrong with it? But, um, like it was all flapping and that. Um, but, and I, I had to do the eulogy for my granddad as well. And that is something I put deep, 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 deep time into to make it. And, I, that, you know, I, and obviously you can't get it right. You can't express what he meant to you. But um, yeah, that was the, that was a long answer to the lowest moment. But yeah. They they say um, people can pass away from heartbreak. Yeah. Is, for, for your grandmother to die six weeks following. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think they would, they would, you know, joined at the hip. Yeah, they used to just kind of, yeah, ma ma yeah, maybe it was that. It was just kind of, yeah, it was just, but also there was such constants and I just wasn't, I'd never really been exposed to death. And it was just this kind of like, to, for it to arrive quite late in your life, it was just a real like, whoa, mm. yeah. And then you lose, and then, and then you've suddenly lost your nan and your granddad who would kind of, like, we we got, like, my nan is particularly just a, such a lovely, she's got proper sort of blue, gray, owly eyes. You know, and she's always like tucking her sort of shirt down and she just come in and just tell you little, st she goes, the just weird little shit. So I remember doing my dissertation. She was staying around her house and she's like, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm doing a, a um, I'm doing my dissertation now. And she said, what about? I said, it was about whether it's right or wrong to advertise to children. And uh, my nan went, it's not. <laughs> like that. <laughs> I kind of went, well, I've got to do 10,000 words. <laughs> So, you know, it's not though, is it? Come on, come and have your tea. I was like, I can't just put, it's not Nancy Veal. I've got to do this. But she was very strange. We used to make flapjacks together as kids, as when I was a kid and she was obviously my nan. But um, we didn't like flapjacks. And but we used to just make them as a thing and then put them in the bin. Fucking weird. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. And the reason we kept doing it is because it really annoyed my mum. Because she's like, what are you doing? Jesus Christ, what's wrong with you? And then she would get the flapjacks out the bin. And that was funny, watching my mum eat flapjacks from a bin. But I got a weird family, man. But, but um, yeah, the, 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 those were the... Uh, I wonder if she did die from heartache. I don't know. I mean, she, you know, they weren't particularly well towards the end of their life as well. They sort of had uh, kind of, you know, the, certainly the beginnings of dementia. So... Um, yeah, it was kind of, you know, it's that horrible thing where, yeah, it, I don't know. It's just kind of yuck, in it, you know. 
How about you? What was the lowest moment of your life? Am I allowed to ask? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the lowest moment of my life. Good question. Hmm. Is it shitty to ask you? No, it's no. Like if, if I can ask someone else, they have to, okay, to ask fine. me. I don't even, it's a, a really interesting question. Um, I think it would probably be, ah, no, I know when it is. I, well, it's the one that kind of stands out to me is really, really sucking. So my, my grandmother dying was one of them, but I wasn't close to her. Right. So it was just actually seeing my dad upset, seeing your like dad cry for the first time was very like, ooh. Yeah, that isn't that, a, if you, have you got a strong dad? Yeah, strong, yeah. Never seen him be emotional at all. Yeah, it's, that's the weirdest thing, isn't Quiet, it? Quiet, passive, just, and then, you know, to see him cry is, yeah. that's very difficult to understand as a yeah. kid. And then the other one is actually when my dad called me into his bedroom and told me he didn't love my mum. Oh, wow. And that they were going to get a divorce. And they didn't get a divorce. They're still together now. But at seven, I think I was, when he said that to me, it was like earth, like foundation shattering information that yeah. I couldn't. I don't know why I always remember that. I don't know why I always re recall that one, you know. It's like I could never forget that moment in my life. What are you meant to do with that at seven? Fucking exactly. Yeah, like, yeah. Especially when it doesn't even happen. But um, their yeah. relationship for me was so toxic as a kid that I actually got to a point later where I'd come to terms with the illusion being burst that your parents actually might not stick together. And then I was actually willing them to get a divorce because they were just screaming at each other too much. So yeah. I think that's probably, that's for some reason, those two moments came to mind. Um, if I told you that you could never write a joke again and you could never perform again. Yeah. What would happen to you? What, I, would... I don't know. It's, hmm. I think you'd go back to, you. I'd end up being what I was when I was younger, of just desperately trying to make people laugh and, and just sort of, I'd just be a, a bit of a nuisance at Tesco. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? When you kind of get in your shop in, you're like, hey, you right? oh, I was looking at a, the sperm donor the other day. <laughs> Oh, yeah, she lives six foot four. And, like, you know what I mean? It's kind of, you know, so I think... Why? I, why? I don't know. I just like making people laugh. I, li mm. I like the... I like... It makes me feel good. And it... it um, yeah, it just makes me feel good. I, I, I kind of... It's like I say, it feels like you're giving them a socially accepted orgasm every time they laugh. So you're literally going, going around making people come. Why don't... <laughs> Why in do, Tesco? Yeah, yeah I know. You know I mean? imagine making someone come in Tesco. But why? Why don't I? Every little help. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> but why don't? That's you, the new head for for Christmas. I'm you know? <laughs> um, sorry. Go on, Carrie. What were you going to say? <laughs> but why don't? Why do you have that that need? And I like I don't. So if you said to me I could never write a joke again, or I could never, you know, perform comedy again, mm. I would fine. Like my life would be unchanged. But for you, yours would be. It'd be like an irritant. And like, yeah, why, but, what's, but, the, what's the difference? Well, it's the same as you, like saying, you know, you can't, you can't have your own business. Mm. Yeah, so you, you got, to, so you've got to work for somebody else. Mm. So how, how does, that, me, how does me, that feel? For me, it's it's a definite loss of purpose. Yeah, for me, it's like a huge loss of purpose. Um, not so much working for someone else, but not being able to like build, yeah, do what I do professionally. It would be this huge sense of like loss of purpose. I might move on to like doing shows or like just writing books all the time or something else. But from a com comedic perspective, it's like what you're doing is like very reliant on feedback of mm. sorts. Mm. So I'm wondering where that's com like coming from. Is that, you know, I we kind of touched on it earlier in the conversation. It's just, yeah, it's been, su it's been such a clear, consistent coping mechanism in the toughest moments of your life, mm. evidently, mm. Um, that it makes me ponder how you would cope without that coping mechanism, dealing with the, the reality of life. You know? Yeah, but I think that's what I sort of said. Laughter is the lubricant that makes life livable. Life is life is tough and laughter provides respite um, th for me. And it, and, and that's, and it's so deeply human. Everyone has, has, irrespective of whether you have a, an easy, blessed life. Everyone has had moments of trials and tribulations and laughter is just a, it's a, it's a thing that soothes us. And I, I find it particularly soothing that you take the, the sting out of pain by just making, making it funny. Do you know what I mean? And it's kind of, it just works for me. I just find laughing or making people laugh just the best because you're in, in the moment of laughter, you're lost. You are not 
of this realm. You're you're kind of in this white noise space, um, and it's good. It's it's a it's a good place to be. Escapism, and, almost. Like, yeah, 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 but but exactly. So you, and then you come back to kind of reality, and you're you're a little bit more reconfigured, or you it lightens the load a bit, you know. And 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 I get a deep sense of satisfa satisfaction from making people laugh. So, and you're right, it is tied up in them. You, you know, it's very needy. That's absolutely true. But then, you know, I'm 41 now and I kind of know who I am. I'm, I'm kind of needy. Most comics are, because I've been asked to write sort of my autobiography quite a few times. And it's like, I just don't f feel like sitting and entertaining myself. Um, whereas when you're writing stand-up, you're writing it for an audience so you can perform or you're making notes and you go, hey, I'll take that on stage and I'll kind of riff it out and figure it out with them. Whereas a book to me just feels like it would be, I don't think I've got the skills to sit down and try and entertain myself and then eventually entertain people through the book. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like I did a thing last year where we went to Australia and New Zealand uh, during the pandemic because um, we were doing some gigs out there and we stayed in the hotel for two weeks and, and we made a stand-up show that blended me meeting people alongside stand-up and it was, it was one of the most satisfying things I've ever done. We met these incredible women in New Zealand, there's a thing called the Coffin Club and what they do is, I didn't know this, it turns out um, uh, di dying is really expensive and coffins are really pricey. And what these retired pensioners do, they make cheap coffins and they kind of sell them for like, you know, 300 bucks, really kind of low, don't make any profit. So they're like these beautiful funeral elves and they make their own coffins as well, um, just for, as a bit of fun. And I met this lady and she'd made three coffins for herself. And I was like, how come she made three? So I just keep putting on weight. <laughs> and, and it was so touching and peculiar and and then we went into another room and there were little baby coffins tiny tiny and it's one of those things that you i hope nobody ever sees that and i was like how and people often say oh comedy hardest job in the world Can you imagine making a coffin for a baby it blew my mind and i looked at this twinkly eyed lady i was like how do you do that how do you get yourself in a place to, to make something that sad and she kind of looked at me and just went I do it so no one else has to. And it was so beautiful. And for me, I, I loved being able to tell that story through stand-up with her at, on the show. And I don't know if I have the skills to tell that story um, through words on a page. Yeah, do you know what I mean? I'm mm -hmm. sort of aware of a, an ability I have as a communicator to make a story like that deeply human. I could tell that in front of anybody and it gets to their heart. It's mm. so pure. And there's so many stories out there like that, that the, trying to find those examples of magnificence, um, I find endlessly interesting, mm. but you don't find them if you sat down writing a book. Mm. You got to get out there and yeah. you, you, you've kind of got to put yourself in peculiar situations. I met a lady that goes yowie hunting. It turns out there's a yowie is a big, eight foot sort of like abominable snowman in Australia uh, that he lives just outside Brisbane. She was absolutely wonderful, right? You know, mad as a box of frogs, but beautiful. And she was like, yeah, what we do, put some cigarettes out and some beer and that should lure him in. Like, so and like, she puts this big jacket on me. She goes, yeah, and it, you might want to make the mating noise. And I'm like, what, how does that go? And she's like, sort of like, Ooh! like some kind of lit in the field going, Ooh! Ooh! and she's like, yeah, you're doing really well. And then I pat, panic because I start going, what if this is real? And suddenly this eight foot bloke comes along and fucks me <laughs> like that. And, and I'm sort of dragged off and you're like, and, it, and then it was so, and I was telling her this and we're laughing and it's funny that, that again, those stories, I love trying to find those stories. So I feel like I don't have enough stories yet to sit down and tell them all. And the great thing about stand-up, you can rotate your stories. You go, hey, do you want to hear this? Mm. Hey, do you want to hear that? Mm. You know, or th things can happen. 
from nowhere. My brother is an ex like we were we were having a conversation with a friend of mine recently, and from nowhere, my brother goes, uh, "What?" Because this bloke was talking about his friend. He goes, "Yeah, he's a vet." My brother goes, "Yeah, to be a vet, you've got to shoot a cow in the face." And I'm like, what's he talking about? He goes, yeah, it's the only way you can be a vet if you've shot a cur in the face. I said, is it? What, so they do six years of school and then right at the end, they give him a Smith and Weston and they blast him in the face. And he's like, well, I don't give him that, you thick fuck. They give him a bolt gun. I'm not, <laughs> not going to shoot him with a rifle. Fucking moron. Like that. So we're having this kind of conversation and I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, true, Kez told me. Oh, Kez told you, yeah, he knows, knows a vet, shot him in the face. So it's like that. Now, weirdly, a month later, I'm doing a gig in Leicester. There's a guy chatting away, and he's he's a he's a vet. And I go, listen, I gotta ask, do they make you shoot cows in the face? And he goes, yeah, yeah, we have to. It's one of the things. The fucker was right. <laughs> so I ring my brother up in the middle of this gig. There's two thousand people there. I ring him up, and I'm like, and, and put him on speaker on the phone. I go, you all right? He goes, yeah, what? And I go, I'm I'm just in Leicester. I'm at a gig. Uh, yeah. And I go, um, yeah, you, you know that thing you were saying about cow. And vets, yeah, it turns out you were right. And he went, yeah, I know. <laughs> and he goes, listen, I've got to go and watch him vigil. <laughs> like that, <laughs> fucked off. But that was the correct story for that night, is, is my point. That, that, that sometimes, and it was so hilarious. In that moment, mm. it couldn't have been more perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then all the ushers that worked there and go, that was planned, right? Yeah. That was yeah. Strange. But, it was, but it only came about because me and my brother were with friends of mine in Exeter, he told a man's story. I had an argument with him. We all laughed because my brother was talking shit. What's he on about? Mm. A month later, I meet a, you know, mm. a vet. He agrees with my brother, and um, the doctor. And we have a moment of, yeah. of, of magic. And it's and it's the funny thing that that's all anyone would remember from that show. Um, so, and I I, I I don't have the skills to do that through sitting on my, on my own. I would be too excited to tell people the story. Quick one. As you probably know by now, I'm trying to make my life a little bit more sustainable and I consider myself to be on a bit of a sustainability journey in the same way that I'm on a health journey. And it's a privilege to be able to share that with all of you. And you, you all know, if you've listened to the last podcast, that I traded in my Range Rover Sport in for an electric bicycle, which is now my only vehicle. And next year, hopefully, I'll have my electric car too, if Tesla hurry up with a Cybertruck. And that's where my energy comes into my life and my sort of sustainability journey. It makes your life, if you are on that sustainability journey, 10 times easier. This is one of the, if you can't see this, I'm holding it in my hand if you're listening on Spotify or Apple. This is one of their renewable energy products. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll, you'll, you'll see this. This is called the Harvey. It's this very clever little device that allows the Zappy and the Eddy, which I've talked about before on this podcast, to be installed into your home without hard wiring or without batteries or without those um, god awful transformers that a lot of people have in their house. It's basically a tiny device that's going to save you both time and money. And for someone like me who doesn't have loads of time on our hands, it's a real lifesaver. If you're looking to make a conscious switch and you need a quick fix that's gonna save you a load of time, then head over to myenergy.com to see this product and many, many more. So Patrice Evra, yes. who sat there before Jimmy Carr said one day his girlfriend turned to him and was like, are you happy? And he and at first he like resisted that question because it makes people feel un a little bit uncomfortable. Mm. But um, yeah, are you happy? Um, yeah. At this moment, yeah, I've really enjoyed this chat, like deeply. And um, I feel pumped up and energized. So yeah, but it's back to what I'm saying. I'm kind of, I need the energy of others to make me happy. You referred to, when I asked that question, you referred to this moment yeah. as if happiness was more of a mood in your view versus then like a long lasting state. If we say, if we were to say that it's a state, a long-lasting sort of the baseline, would you say you're happy? Um, yeah, I, I'd say I have more, I have more moments of happiness than sadness, and then, so, but but I'm in a state of flux with that. Like, I, you know, I can be super low and super uh, sort of depressed about. Oh, fucking hell, the jokes are shit this week in the show. God, I've got, they haven't got the stuff. You know what I mean? So I kind of, I can let things get on top of me. Um, but I have more moments of happiness than sadness, I think. Have you ever experienced what they call like depression, like clinical depression um, in your view? 
I don't know. I don't think so. Um, I, you know, I have moments of like, where you can't, you know, you, be you sort of aware you need to shift it. But I'm very much at right, get on the treadmill, lift some weights, um, kind of uh, do something kind of a guy. I'm restless, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I've never been, you know, diagnosed or anything like that. But, uh, but yeah, how about you? Are you happy? It's such um, a heavy question, right? It's a really heavy question. I remember the first time my... Uh... Fucking Patrice Evra. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah. What an interesting, fascinating bloke he is as well. Just <laughs> crikey. Remarkable, remarkable yeah. guy. Am I happy? Um, I remember the first time I was asked it and it felt really uncomfortable and I felt defensive about the question. Yeah. My PA, who was also my girlfriend at the time, many years, long story, we won't go into that. Um, she asked me in the car one day, she was like, are you happy? I was like, how dare you? <laughs> I think that's, that's my reaction. Say. No, of course not. But oh, that's right, kind of, right. I think like my ego in, like, inside my chimp brain probably was like, how fucking dare? Like, of course I am. Um, I believe so, yeah. I believe so. Um, and one of the things that I has helped me a lot is to, I'm very obsessed with gratitude and like constantly reminding myself of like how unbelievably fortunate I am to be w one of the free ones. And what I mean by that is like financially free, free to do what I choose to most mm. days. Mm. Um, of course I have days where it sucks and my mood's shitty and like I'm irritable and I'm a bit of an asshole to be around, but um, I, feel, I feel somewhat content um, despite my relentless uh, excruciating ambition. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good answer. I'll take that one. Okay. <laughs> Your manager said you're a, you're the hardest working comic he's he's ever met. Right. Yeah. Well, I just like is that toxic? People in this in our society at the moment of there's this kind of stigma around people that work too hard that it's you know toxic productivity or yeah, but it's it's sort of you know you you work at something that you love, so it's kind of like you know. It's it's sort of those moments of like, you, you just lose yourself in it. It's like, I imagine this is the same with when Picasso was painting. Do you know what I mean? He was just probably like, this is fun. Like, do you know what I mean? That, that, like, I you know, imagine his, I'm not comparing myself to Picasso. I'm using him as an example of just sort of, imagine his, his manager going, you need to fucking relax, mate. Do you know what I mean? The Sistine Chapel rapper. <laughs> but it's just, I don't know. I just, I, I love it. And I don't, um... I don't mind working hard. It's all, and it's also it's not it's not working in the in the true sense. Like you just said, how fortunate to be one of the free ones. What like it's ridiculous. Like I I write the t I write stand up on my own, but I do I do my TV show and I write it with um, f five people, and um, we get to write jokes. That is our job. It is an unbelievably privileged job to be able to sit around and think of funny things for people. And that can be stressful, but there are people working in um, in jobs that they don't like that would kill for that opportunity. So you're right, you need those moments to kind of snap yourself out of your funk and, um, and remember that you're getting paid to do a hobby, hmm. ultimately, you know, in, in my case. Um, and in mine, like this is yeah, totally. But yeah, but, like, but, yeah, but, yeah. but my point yeah. being, it's sort of like there's no, there's nothing wrong with having low moments, and everyone does. And it feels like the world is better now in terms of being able to talk about them. But you also, I think, if you come from a certain background, you don't want to bitch and moan about yourself and kind of say that you're having a tough time or whatever. But if you're lucky enough to have friends that you can talk to um, or things like this or a therapist or whatever, it just make, it makes the pursuit of happiness a lot easier, I think. Because I think that is, poss maybe that's what happiness is. It's about talking for long enough to realize what you have, whether that is a loving relationship, whether it's a job you love, whether it's a hobby you adore. But there, there will always be sort of shimmering lights of hope in in the misery but sometimes somebody has to help you find them i think do you know what i mean because i think it's very difficult to sit within yourself and go yeah i can see everything's fine sometimes you need a little bit of help to kind of remind you of how lucky you are your upcoming netflix special you called it lubricant i yes. now know why yeah yeah 
But tell me what we can expect from this special and, and how it was conceived and what makes it, you know, I guess, worth watching. Wow. Um, it is the best stories and jokes that I've written in the last two years from traveling around the world. I did a, a, a tour that was called Respite. And I kind of put together all the best bits about kind of conspiracy theories and uh, uh, COVID and leadership and madness in the world. And I sort of splodged it all together. And the you never quite know what it is until you sort of step away from it. And I think it's actually a love letter to laughter. That's what the show is. And it's the the full hour is about the the importance of of giggling and of being silly and how deeply human it is and and it should be treasured. There's a bit in the in the special where I, I was chatting about you know when you hear somebody play a musical instrument and you're envious of the notes they're making it strikes me that laughter is a musical instrument that any one of us can play. And now is not the time to put down our fucking trumpets. Mm -hmm. And it, that's what if that's the show really, it's about the importance of laughter and, and, and the role it plays in which we do life. Um, and it's lots of funny stories that are kind of all about that really. You talked about how as a comedian, you have to kind of have this like self evolution. Uh huh. What, what evolution in the comedian that you are in this special, Lubricant, yeah. ha have, have you observed in yourself? Um, I'm slower and I'm um, more thoughtful and I try and make it more interesting for people sat at home than in the room. I think previously I've been a bit too kind of high octane and I'm trying to kind of make it pleasurable for people at home so they can sit and enjoy it because that's how it ultimately is consumed. I have a fascination with anger and I have a fascination with, with beauty. I don't like, so I find anger strange and I find beauty beguiling. And that is only getting deeper and deeper. So for example, that story about the ladies in the coffins, that isn't in this show, but it's, it's somewhere deep in me. And I think that will come out in another show. So it's sort of, the, the evolution as a comedian for me is that I want the next, special on the next tour that I do to be deeply human. And I want it to be this, in, 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 in the best sense, a place where you can fucking nod with me or, and laugh with me and feel like this connection with people next to you. And I think that comes through the, ex, through exploring how fucking weird and silly we all are. And I think, I think the world's taking itself very seriously at the moment. And um, there's so much humor in it. I think there's so much humor in the, on the edges, on, in, the, in the shades of serious stuff. Do you know what I mean? I kind of find it, uh, yeah, that's kind of what, that's where it feels like my evolution is. That I'm trying to kind of, I try and talk about, you know, I quite like to being able to talk about serious stuff. For example, you know, we, you know, talk about cancel culture or woke. Like the amount of times you hear the word woke in newspapers at the minute. It's, and it's because it just sells, it sells papers, man. And it's kind of like, hey, have you seen what they've done? Uh, uh, you, you can't say the word fart and, and, and boobies and arse in Scrabble. That's a story in the newspaper. And it was like fury as woke Scrabble bosses. No one's furious about Scrabble. No one's like just, and even if they were doing that, how are they going to police it? No one's going to, you know, break into your house. You go, did you put clit on a triple letter? They're not going to do that. So I find that mechanism really interesting at the moment that, the, that the you go, okay, clearly there's money to be made in kind of, you won't fucking believe what they've done now, eh? <laughs> that in, in, in that energy, but, but also recognizing that it's just a trick. It's, it's, it's fake a, outrage. It's yeah. fake outrage and it's kind of, it's the what next brigade. And I, but I find that really interesting. That was like Piers Morgan's whole thing for a while on TV. It was like, they've changed toilets to unisex. And yeah. I fucking, yeah, but, yeah. But, but because it, it sort of like, it just, it works. It's easy. It's click. And then you, and you're there, but it's kind of not, it's just not nourishing. And there is actually a way of, of, of making 
the people that are that succumb to that and the people that think it's bullshit, you can bring them together through really piss funny stories. Um, or tr- like that story about the coffin and the the lady. Mm. Doesn't doesn't matter your political orientation, doesn't matter your gender, whatever. That's a deeply funny human story. And like you look at someone like Billy Connolly, like like some of his bits are so beautiful and funny, or George Carlin, that 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 they're they're majestic and and you're kind of lost. And I think there's a real value to to humor and it's it's often overlooked because it is silly. And it is kind of fart, piss, shit, fuck. You know what I mean? It's kind of you know what I mean? It's fingers and ears and yeah. but it it it's it's a release and it's kind of it's a deeply important thing, laughter. Deeply, deeply important. And if we didn't have it, you know, the like I think it's only like dolphins and rats are the only animals that laugh. I don't know how scientists found that out. Oh no, I do actually. They tickled the rats' bellies with a pencil. This is presumably pre-COVID. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Imagine that if it's just kind of vaccine. I'm busy just trying to <laughs> trying to get this rat to giggle. But um, but yeah. So that's lubricant. That's just, is it December fourteenth? December the fourteenth comes yeah. out, and it then was got... it was respite. Um, that's it's the it oh, was the did. show respite, and then right at the last minute, I decided to call it lubricant. Love it. Uh, but that becomes a. Pl- I mean, we all know now. Listening to this, why it's called that. But mm. it's kind of forty minutes in, you go, all oh, right. There might be some furious perverts <laughs> who are kind of going, this, where's there's absolutely nothing here about like about Vaseline, <laughs> about KY jelly. This is it's bereft of any <laughs> lubricational. I, you I know. hope someone writes in yeah, at least a review. <laughs> this is not what you think it is. <laughs> it's absolutely disgusting. I was fucking outraged. And then you've got Until the Wheels Come Off as well, which is a documentary. So right? yeah, so until the Wheels Come Off is a documentary about making a stand-up special throughout the COVID, COVID pandemic. Yeah. So yeah, it was kind of, uh, yeah, sort of cameras followed us around and tried to, you know, like we did gigs in football stadiums and car parks and- Crazy. Yeah, it was brilliant. Crazy it was nuts. Sense, but we did uh, Ashton Gate, uh, which is the home of Bristol City. Um, and we had to get 2,000 people in a 10,000 uh, seater stand. They all had to be spread out. And it was one of the weirdest gigs I've ever done, but it's one of the best. And that comes out on the same day? So the the the, the doc is on the same day as the special. So yeah. Well, wow. Yeah. Amazing. We have one. I'm, I'm excited for both. I actually did get the chance to watch the trailer. All right, nice. And it was hilarious. Oh, thanks, man. And it's, um, I'm particularly excited to see someone with your smarts and both comedic genius and intellect take on recent times. Yes. Does that make sense? That's yeah, totally. I'm, I'm most excited about. And uh, so really, really looking forward to that on December 14th. We have a, a long-standing tradition on this podcast where yes. the previous guest, as I mentioned, writes a question for the next guest. So Patrice wrote, are you happy? Because that was the question that stumbled upon him. I don't, I'm not going to say who the person was that's written this for you, okay. but I'm going to tell you what the, um, the question is. Um, what three things would you give to the world, you can only answer with single words, to make it happier? Jesus. Not, Jesus? Not that. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's one. <laughs> what three things would I give to the world to make it happier? You can only answer with one, one letter, one, one words answers. I mean, this is a real reverse Aladdin moment, isn't it? Um, a fixed climate. Okay. Yeah. I know that's two words, but fine. you know, fine. I'm fine. That's the first thing. Technology that stops mental health. See, so you zap them, okay. and they're fine. <laughs> It's just sort of a wand you wave at them okay. and it fixes them. Mental health wand. Right. Yeah. So yeah, a mental, a mental. Yeah. So that's yeah. Fixed climate, mental health wand, and food. Food. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like fixed climate, mental health wand, food, and starvation. And starvation. And it will oh, end starvation. Yes. Right. Not yeah. and starvation. No. No. Yeah. I was going to say. Fuck <laughs> me. I give and I take. Now I'm going to ask you to do the same. I, but before I do that, I just want to say a huge thank you for coming today because I've watched you on screen for many, many, many years. I find you hyster- hysterical, but also I, I love this opportunity to get to know a side of you that I wouldn't have ordinarily seen on screen because of the the way that, you know, the format of TV and a depth in you. And you're just, you're, again, you're super smart, super introspective. You're a genius, clearly. And um, you're doing a service to the world, which is clearly so unbelievably self selfless in cheering people up at a time when they really need it, that I, I feel like the comedians amongst us 
who are lubricating us through these hard times are national treasures at the moment. So thank oh, you. Oh, mate, what a sweet thing. I need you to come home and uh, say that whenever I'm having <laughs> problems with my wife. We'll send you the audio <laughs> clip so you could do that. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> but it's time to write a question. Uh, 